Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, Canadians rush home hours before strict new border rules come into effect. I purposely changed the flight to come back a day earlier. We decode the new rules meant to slow the spread of those concerning new variants, while officials gear up for the largest one-week vaccine delivery yet. We have people that are just so excited that finally we have sufficient vaccine. Are the provinces ready to hand it out? Also tonight, an American airline grounds its Boeing 777s after a frightening engine failure caught on camera. You could just feel it like boom. My first thought was that the whole plane was coming down. Plus. This is Paul Schaefer over here, ladies and gentlemen. 71 years into a remarkable life, Paul Schaefer on the magic moments. Well, it certainly was wild. And a new honor for writing this song. It's raining men. This is The National. For Canadians coming home and for many anxiously waiting to roll up their sleeve for a vaccine, this will be a big week in the fight against COVID-19. Canada will hit a new high in vaccine delivery. More than 600,000 doses will flow into the country this week. And travelers will be hit with new quarantine and testing rules that could cost them thousands of dollars upon their return. Not only that, many travelers say the new rules are confusing and difficult to comply with. Farah Morali begins our coverage at Pearson International Airport, where some people raced home today to beat the deadline. At Canada's biggest airport, passengers stream through the international arrivals gate hours before new quarantine rules come into effect. The crew member just told me like it was the busiest day in last few weeks, I mean today and yesterday, because of, uh, you know, this is the last weekend. Many, like Vihan Bavsar, booked or changed their flight to come back early. Oh, of course, convenient to come today um, and not tomorrow because three days in a hotel isn't, isn't really, uh, you know, great. I purposely changed the flight to come back a day earlier to make it before midnight tonight. Starting tomorrow, everyone returning to Canada from non-essential trips must pay to stay at a designated hotel to quarantine for three days. The government originally said the cost would be $2,000, but hotels CBC News contacted gave lower estimates. Some of the nightly stays are less expensive than was originally thought. That's great. Uh, the idea is that the hotels can determine the cost themselves with the individual travelers. Well, now it's been 42 minutes. But for some trying to get home, cost isn't the issue. It's actually getting through to the government line to book the hotels, since you can't book online. I've been trying since yesterday, got disconnected twice out of three times, been waiting like two hours and a half, and over two hours and a half, I've actually got disconnected. They put you on hold, it's been three hours now. I'm willing to take the, the three-day quarantine um, at these hotels, but we need access to do it. Also starting tomorrow, mandatory testing for passengers arriving in Vancouver, Calgary and Montreal. That's already at Pearson. Well, listen, well, you have to do whatever you can to protect everybody. The federal government said the new rules aren't set in stone and could still change if needed. Far new rules are also coming tomorrow for the people who return to Canada at a land crossing. Tell us more about that. That's right, Ian. So people crossing over by land won't be required to quarantine at a hotel, but they will be required to follow new testing rules. And those rules are this. In addition to having proof of a recent negative result from a COVID-19 test, they'll have to be tested again at the crossing. The rules also say that towards the end of their quarantine period, they'll have to be tested a third time. And so while these individuals crossing by land uh, will be able to quarantine in their homes, uh, the government is stepping up testing for them. Thanks, Farah. Just as worry is ramping up over the threat posed by more contagious variants of the virus, vaccine shipments are climbing too. Ashley Burke now with a record number expected to arrive this week and the plans to get them to you. After almost two months in complete lockdown, shoppers packed parking lots in newly reopened Ottawa today. The urge to find some normalcy is powerful. And for that, help is on the way. Have you ever fainted? More than 643,000 doses of COVID vaccines set to arrive in Canada this week, the biggest weekly delivery yet. We're going to see a significant ramp up in these last weeks of February and into March as well. 
Speaking on Rosemary Barton Live, Intergovernmental Affairs Minister Dominic LeBlanc said he's confident provinces are prepared for the flood of doses coming. Provinces certainly tell us they're anxious and ready to receive more vaccines, as I know all Canadians are. So we're quite confident it'll be very effective. Across the country, preparations are underway. In Saskatchewan, this mass vaccination centre set up, drive throughs ready to go and mobile units in the works. In Ontario, additional vaccination centres popping up to treat more people. After weeks of delivery delays, anticipation is building. The level of excitement, delight is palpable because people are seeing that finally the vaccine is available and they're going to be able to be protected against COVID-19. But that excitement tempered. Counts may be dipping, but some doctors say cities are now reopening at the wrong time when new, more transmissible variants are on the loose. I think we're doing uh, really everything too quickly. Um, I think we should be taking a real pause across the province and across the country to realize how serious the implications of these variants are. A concern backed up by Canada's top doctor. Variant cases have been reported in every province. More than 700 confirmed, but not every sample is tested. So Dr. Teresa Tam is cautioning everyone to keep following strict measures. With more contagious variants spreading, further lifting of the public health measures will cause the epidemic to resurge rapidly and strongly. Ashley, with this vaccine news, lots of Canadians want to know when they'll get their shots. So what can you tell us about that? Well, Ian, provinces are scrambling to finalize their rollout plans. Each has its own strategy. For example, Ontario is developing an online portal where the public can book appointments. In provinces like BC, those eligible can pre-register online or by phone starting next month. Alberta is planning to roll out a campaign like it did with the flu shot, where pharmacies and family doctors give out the shot to the masses. And Manitoba's even created a vaccine queue calculator where people can estimate when they should get their shot. All right. Ashley, thank you. Thank you. Another Ontario region will begin to reopen Monday at 12.01 a.m. York region north of Toronto will move away from stay at home into the red control zone. So that will allow for outdoor social gatherings of up to 25 people and limited seating in restaurants. Neighboring Toronto and Peel regions will remain locked down until at least March 8th at the request last week of their chief medical officers of health. More Quebec schools have now shut their doors over worries that more contagious virus variants may have gotten in. Nearly all staff and students at a Quebec City primary school have now been tested for COVID-19 after at least one suspected case was linked to the school. It closed on Friday. Two Montreal schools also closed this weekend and set out to test their students. U.S. President Joe Biden's first official meeting with a foreign head of government will be with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The two will meet virtually on Tuesday. It's expected to last more than an hour. In a statement, the Prime Minister referred to the shared border and common values, saying, I look forward to my meeting with President Biden, where we'll work together to end the COVID-19 pandemic and support people in both of our countries. There's much work to do before that can happen, as the U.S. closes in on a pandemic milestone tonight. The death toll from COVID-19 is nearing half a million, even as the spread appears to be slowing down and more people get vaccinated. Here's Katie Simpson. Lineups stretched for blocks as word spread in San Francisco of a new pop-up vaccine site. I looked online and said it's fully booked everywhere in California. So I'm, I think this is great that I can come down here. The prospect of getting a shot serves as a glimmer of hope in this moment of darkness. It's stunning when you look at the numbers, almost unbelievable, but it's true. It, this is a devastating pandemic. Hundreds of Americans are still dying each day. The death toll surpassing the population of some major cities, including Miami. More than one year into this pandemic fight, we are armed with more knowledge and better resources. Yet this battle is still a long way from over. Do you think Americans will still be wearing masks, for example, in 2022? You know, I think it is possible that that's the case. The reluctance to embrace masking is seen as a failure by a former member of the Trump administration. The initial resistance came at a time when there was a PPE shortage and the Centers for Disease Control feared a surge in demand could hurt frontline workers. 
then made the mistake of conflating that with a, a, uh, a set of advice that masks don't work effectively for the general public. That was a big mistake. The Biden administration is now being pressed on whether there should be an investigation into the U.S. COVID response. I believe that we need to take a variety of steps to look at this, the previous administration's response to the pandemic and what lessons we need to learn to make sure that never happens again. There are signs the COVID fight is headed in a better direction. The daily new case average is now 67,000, down from 249,000 just over a month ago. And more than 63 million Americans have had at least one dose of the vaccine. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Breaking late tonight, Boeing is recommending airlines ground its 777s with a specific engine model after one of those engines exploded on a flight out of Denver yesterday. Briar Stewart has the harrowing events and the recommendations that quickly followed. Hear it? Yeah. That was the view from the ground, but for the 241 people on board the Boeing 777, it was much more dramatic and terrifying. All of a sudden, it was just this big, you could just feel it like boom, and you could hear it, and you just, we started shaking. We uh, looked at each other, my wife and I, and held hands and just wished our kids would see them again. <laughs> One of the engines erupted into flames shortly after taking off from Denver. From the cockpit came a mayday call. United 328 Heavy Mayday aircraft uh, just experienced an engine failure. Need to turn immediately. Parts from the plane's right engine started pummeling to the earth, scattering across a Colorado neighborhood. Next thing you know, we heard another big bang and looked out our front window right as the engine cowl rolled into the tree. So it landed right straight up and down in the bed of my truck, smashed the whole truck in. And No one was hurt and the plane was able to land back safely in Denver. But tonight, Boeing said it recommends suspending the use of all 777s with the same Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engine until the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration comes up with an inspection protocol. The recommendation comes just hours after United grounded its fleet. So Pratt & Whitney got to work. The engine model first took flight more than 35 years ago. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board is investigating, and aviation experts say there have been other incidents. Well, I know of five or six that have happened uh, uh, where the, the fan section has caused a problem, and uh, certainly uh, this, there was one also in the 13th of February 2018 same type of airplane, same type of engine, and it looks like a uh, similar failure. The 777s flown by Air Canada have a different engine design, so they're not impacted. Officials say in the case of the United flight, two fan blades were fractured, and an investigation is underway. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Millions of people in Texas are still without clean drinking water tonight. Today, the governor said bottled water deliveries will continue. Do you see aircraft like this that has been flying water into Texas and then deployed across the state of Texas. This weekend, lineups for water snaked through parking lots and down streets, though some boil water advisories were lifted today. Power in the state has been mostly restored, but water treatment facilities remain crippled by the cold snap that hit the state last week. The storms and the chaos that followed caused dozens of deaths. And thousands of people took to the streets of Myanmar to mourn two protesters killed by authorities on Saturday. Tensions growing as leaders of the ongoing military coup warn against a general strike planned for Monday. Let's turn now to a Go Public investigation. An elaborate wire transfer scam has devastated a Vancouver woman. She's lost her family's entire life savings. And tonight, her story is raising questions about what role banks should play in protecting their customers. Here's Erica Johnson. We have my picture on it. Fraudsters sent Vivian Zhang a fake warrant for her arrest, told her she was a suspect in an international money laundering scam and had to cooperate or face jail in Hong Kong. So I think I was in a panic mode. I do everything they asked me to do. 
What they instructed her to do, incredible as it may sound, was to wire money to Hong Kong, claiming it would be inspected and sent back. So, under extreme pressure and sworn to secrecy, she visits four major banks and sends $340,000, her family's life savings. After her last wire transfer, the fraudsters disappear. Zhang realizes too late she was duped, but then starts to question why the banks didn't act on red flags. She was sending large amounts of money, had never wired money to Hong Kong before, and she's a Chinese immigrant, a target group reported in the media. None of them gave me any piece of warning that I could be a potential uh, victim of the fraud. Zhang is now suing to try to get her money back, but all four banks argue they followed wire transfer protocols. This financial crime expert says those protocols need beefing up. If those processes demonstrate that there's a breakdown that costs your clients money, certainly it might be the time to revisit those processes so that your clients don't experience future losses in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. It adds up to tens of millions every year, and that's just the reported wire fraud. A problem the UK is battling with a strategy introduced five years ago that trains bank tellers to call the police if they suspect a scam. It's saving millions a year. But the Canadian Bankers Association admits there isn't a direct equivalent in Canada. Meantime, Zhang has yet to tell her elderly father she lost his life savings to fraudsters, worried it will severely affect his health. It certainly affected her health, and all the stress has caused Zhang to lose her job, all because she fell victim to an elaborate fraud that no one caught. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. As you saw earlier, Dominic LeBlanc spoke on Rosemary Barton Live about the COVID vaccine rollout. The president of the Privy Council also talked about where the government is in choosing a process to select the next governor general. We recognize it's important to choose an outstanding Canadian to, uh, to succeed Madame Payette and to be governor general. And the prime minister will have more to say on that in the coming days. Last month, Julie Payette resigned amid a scathing report into a toxic work environment at Rideau Hall, a review triggered by a CBC News investigation interviewing dozens of Rideau Hall employees. A storied career that started in a Toronto living room and took him to living rooms across North America. Anyway, it's not, is it over? Coming up. Paul Schaefer reflects on a career that spans nearly half a century in show business. Well, it certainly was wild. There's no question about it. Plus, we speak to changemakers on what it means being black in Canada. I've walked in a room and they ask, where's the real doctor? But first, rescheduled games and sideline players. It's hard to argue that something didn't happen on the ice. The COVID effect on the NHL and why Canada's division is making out better than those south of the border. We're back in a moment. That's it. Novak Djokovic still unconquered. Despite a torn stomach muscle, Djokovic snapped Daniel Medvedev's 20-match winning streak to win his ninth Australian Open and 18th Grand Slam, just two behind the record shared by Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. The pandemic forced a three-week delay in that tournament, and it's continuing to make trouble for the NHL as well. Kreider puts it in a wide-open net, as you described, Joe. When the New York Rangers trounced the Washington Capitals Saturday, they did it without the services of winger Capo Caco. He's among the latest players to be added to the league's COVID-19 protocols list. That's forcing teams to reschedule games, but no teams in the Canadian division have had to revise their schedules. Jamie Strachan looked into why. Now they're ready. Here we go. Days after the New Jersey Devils and Buffalo Sabres played back-to-back -back games in late January, more than 20 players tested positive for COVID. More and more guys kept testing positive, and we're just like, okay, when is this going to hopefully end soon? And it was just more and more and just kind of avalanche. The Sabres' 61-year-old coach also got sick. Definitely time to realize uh, how 
how lethal this COVID is. Just Nothing has been proven definitively, but some experts say close contact during a game is likely a factor. You see events like that Buffalo, New Jersey game where, you know, you see a lot of people that come out infected on both sides. That really is hard to argue that something didn't happen on the ice. The NHL schedule requires almost nightly revisions. Dozens of games have been postponed and rescheduled, but only for American teams. The same starters and the same starting lineups as we saw on Monday night. Tonight. The league's all-Canadian division hasn't missed a game, likely because of more widespread community protocols north of the border. When you look at Canada, I mean, we, for the most part, we can't go to restaurants, we can't go to gyms, and that's really not the case in the U.S. And so, you know, I think that the players probably behave like as much as they adhere to the NHL protocols, there is a bit more of a relaxed uh, approach, I think. And so um, certainly they may be putting themselves in positions where they could uh, come in contact with COVID. Well, a different look behind the Leaf bench. And I mean, behind the coaches, there's no glass behind them. The NHL has made adjustments on the fly, like removing the glass behind players' benches to increase ventilation. More rapid testing has also been added. And in recent days, numbers have fallen. But as the season wears on, it will continue to be a fine line between safety and getting teams onto the ice. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. A Winnipeg celebrity, a fixture in the sports scene, is being recognized this week for his community service. Gabrielle Langlois, better known as Dancing Gabe, is an institution and an inspiration in the city. As Aaron Broman shows us, he's a sports fan with plenty of fans of his own. Go, go. It's game day. Dancing Gabe is up. For long, so is the crowd. I cheer for the home team, uh, get wild, and that works. He's a fixture at hockey, football, baseball, and soccer games, pumping up the fans with his dance moves infusing passion into the game. We always want to try to find him in the stand somewhere else. It's not a Winnipeg game until you see Dancing Gabe. Uh, if there was one greatest fan in Winnipeg of all time, I think Dancing Gabe would be that guy. On Tuesday, he'll be officially awarded an honorary community development diploma from Red River College. He's a longtime volunteer with the YMCA and YWCA of Winnipeg. Many people nominated him. It's his uplifting and positive attitude uh, here in our community and really he embodies the spirit of, uh, you know, uh, of, of what we are, which is friendly Manitoba. Oh, it's amazing. Felt, uh, it's brilliant. Felt like graduation day all over again. Thank you very much. In 2015, Gabe received a community now, service award from the city of Winnipeg. He's also been awarded the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal. He has autism and lends his support to charities for people with disabilities. He is my hero. Gabe lives with his sister. Five years ago, they lost their parents. I know they're, they're above watching over us. And uh, yeah, I'm just, just so proud of them. Gabe hasn't been able to do what he loves most, with the stands mostly off limits to fans. But his fans are cheering loudly. He deserves, a, deserves an award and I'm, I'm so happy and proud for him. Keep on going. Keep on dancing. With a province behind him, that's exactly Gabe's plan. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Coming up, after a year of global reckoning for black lives. Change moves at the speed of empathy. What it means to three Canadians on the front lines of change. But first, NASA engineer Farah Alibay, who's Canadian, showed the world how excited she was when the NASA rover Perseverance landed on Mars this week. Today, the daughter of immigrants from Madagascar spoke on Rosemary Barton Live. The world of aerospace is improving. You know, we're about 30% visible minorities and 30% women. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now that I've made that place at the table, I've also made it my mission to open up seats for minorities. You're going to fail. I failed so many times. It was not a straight path to get here. But it was so worth it. I, you know, pick yourself up each time, find your allies, find the people that will help you because you only need one or two open doors to be living, you know, the life that you really want. Wisdom from a woman who has reached for the stars.
Welcome back. For months, CBC News has been shining a spotlight on the experiences of black Canadians. Through special programming, news stories and online, the initiative Being Black in Canada shares experiences from struggle to achievement. Tonight, the National hears from three black men, an actor, a doctor and an activist who are working to create change in this country, one conversation at a time. Asha Tomlinson introduces us. I feel very, very grounded and clear of what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I'm on your wall. This is and that's crazy. a nice feeling. I'm Jesse Lipscomb, the founder of Make It Awkward. What does it really mean? It's a campaign against racism, hate, and discrimination, capturing national attention. And why the name Make It Awkward? It's kind of a, like I'm urging people to do that, to make and have awkward conversations. That's the place you need to be in, uh, feel that awkwardness and try and make some change. Jesse shifted from acting to activism after an incident in his hometown of Edmonton four years ago. Uh, filming this commercial about how wonderful our city is, there's countless things you can do downtown before the big event and afterwards. In between takes, I was walking back and this car pulls up. The car pulls up and screams out of the window. Walk over to the car, open the door, get down on a knee. I got to the level that I talked to my children at because it felt like that needed to happen in this scenario. And I asked the gentleman, why did you say that? And what I did to the person who said it was I made it awkward with them. Many say the racial reckoning of 2020 after the killing of George Floyd was unprecedented. Did you feel that change? Sometimes your aha moment is someone else's ouch. And now all these people who are saying, now I know, now I know. It is wonderful, but it is painful and it is triggering for the people you love and care about and call friends and find out that they're, they're, they're very racist, slightly racist, a little bit racist. Um, and I'm so happy that they're on the journey to be less of that. How do you explain everything that happened last year to your three boys? I explain by actions. They watch their circle be entrenched with, you know, the work to create an equal playing field for people. So it's more about how do I armor them up in a way to know what tools to use in the face of injustice when they see it. And Jesse plans to keep fighting injustice one awkward conversation at a time. I would tell you this, change moves at the speed of empathy. If we want to have change, the faster we can empathize with people who don't look like us, don't sound like us, don't talk like us or walk like us, the faster we'll see this, this wonderful place that we're trying to get to. I just think for the betterment of our kids, the betterment of healthcare, betterment of society, we need to be more inclusive and embrace diversity. I am Kwajo Karen Mantang. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician, researcher, and uh, host of the podcast, Solving Healthcare. Dr. Karen Mantang has been on the COVID front lines in Ottawa. I'm sure you've heard though of the complaints of racism within the healthcare system. There's so many aspects to that, Asha. Like I've, on a personal level, I've been, you know, I've walked in a room and they ask, where's the real doctor? Or I want a real doctor. I've been thrown insults. I've been called the N word uh, by patients. In terms of, you know, how you see patients being treated, like some, there's a, at times you'll see some judgments happening on patients, you know, based on the color of their skin and they've been treated a different way. You know, we've seen with COVID too that this has disproportionately affected the BIPOC community. And until this year, we weren't even capturing that data, race-based data, which I think has been wrong at so many levels because without knowing who COVID or any other ailment is, who's hitting the hardest, how are we not gonna address the issue? You know, and I think this is one thing that, you know, COVID has put a lens on is how, you know, race matters. 
A father of three black boys, he worries about what they'll have to face in the future. It really hit home after the killing of George Floyd. Seeing a man die in that way and being treated like an animal, he was being like he was treated like an animal. Where he's asking for his life, he's asking for his mom, and we have to. I, I couldn't even go through it. I couldn't watch the whole thing. It brings you back to every, all the instances, instances that you had as a child, as, a, as an adult, and, 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 and the, the, the feeling of injustice. No justice, no peace. The collective call for change afterwards inspired him to talk about race more on his podcast and mentor black youth in his community. I think people are trying to embrace diversity more and they see the value of it and they see what systemic issues have been taking place. And I think even the fact that, you know, we're starting to capture race-based data, like all these little steps, I think we're moving forward in the, in the, and in the right direction. for people my age that we don't have to be another statistic. We can rise above that. No matter what culture you're from, hope is the aspiration in life that keeps you alive. My name is Jacob Calendar Prasad, born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I am an activist for um, black culture in Canada. Jacob has quickly emerged as a young leader in the anti-black racism movement in BC. He started speaking out after being racially profiled multiple times. Back in 2017, a few days before Christmas, I was getting groceries for my mom from the corner store when I was taken down by undercover police. They pinned me down to the ground. Several officers then came out. They had a gun to my uh, back. They were checking me, had a knee on my back as well. At the very end, they told me they suspected me for two attempts of murder. Then they said I was the wrong person and this was all mistaken identity. Burnaby RCMP apologized with a $25 gift card and a tour of their detachment. And that wasn't the first time he'd been profiled. Even talking about it right now, it's still very hard because when I see an officer, I don't feel the same welcomeness that I used to feel being younger. What was it like for you to watch the video of George Floyd's killing? When I saw that video, I cried. My heart broke. I was outraged. I was hurt, sad, mad, didn't know what to feel at the time, and I wanted to do something. I wanted to change something. So Jacob organized his first demonstration last May in Vancouver. He only expected dozens to join him. Instead, thousands showed up. What was that like? Amazing and heartwarming. There was a moment when we did a moment of silence for the fallen at the art gallery and everyone went silent and put their fists up. You had every culture that you could think of standing there together supporting one major issue and that was racism. Those are just some of the stories we have featured online in our Being Black in Canada project. You can follow us on our website at cbc.ca slash beingblackincanada and on Instagram at cbcbeingblackincanada. Windows into the celebration and struggles of Canada's black community. Coming up, he's best known for being David Letterman's music man, but during COVID, Canadian Paul Schaefer is taking his act to the streets. I just felt like the right time to go to the locations in New York that I specifically love. Well, I followed her to the station. We did stay in. We did some some uh, soft blues in the station there, and it you know nobody was the wiser. A great excuse to get out of the house during COVID. Now, Schaefer has something to celebrate. He's being inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, the latest achievement in a career that spanned five decades and took him from backstage in Toronto to late night in New York. Thank you so much, David. You changed our lives. 
His reflections on decades in showbiz. My interview with Paul Schaefer right after this. Oh, what's going on here? Hi. Oh, Hi, guys. guys. Artie Pufkin, Polymer Records. Nice to see you. And where is this is Final Tap, the cult comedy classic, and the man who played record promoter Artie Fufkin, Canadian Paul Schaefer. One of the many iconic pop culture moments that Schaefer is connected to, but it was musical talent that carried him from Thunder Bay to New York City. And The National has learned that this coming Thursday, one of his songs will be inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Just the latest achievement in a career that has spanned decades. From his first gig as a music director for the Toronto production of Godspell in the early 70s, filled with stars of the future. You know, maybe this show isn't what I'm used to and everything, but I. To the first five seasons of Saturday Night Live. From New York, it's Saturday Night Live. There's only one guy who could have set this whole benefit up. And I'm looking at him, Don Kirshner, and you know that. Don't give me, Jerry. It was your idea. Paul Schaefer has forged a long, successful career melding music and comedy. This is Paul Schaefer over here, ladies and gentlemen. And, of course, this is what made Schaefer a household name. As good a friend as you can have on television, as good a friend as you can have in life, Paul Schaefer. How about that band? Thank for more than three decades, he was known as the man behind the piano Thank for David so Letterman. But it's for writing the music to this dance hit of the early 80s, It's Raining Men, that Schaefer will be honored by the Songwriters Hall of Fame. I caught up with Paul Schaefer from his home in Westchester County, New York. Paul Schaefer, it's a real thrill uh, to speak with you. Talk about a thrill. This is not only a thrill, but an honor. And I, but I'm really serious. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you, Ian. Well, and speaking of honors and induction into the Canadian Songwriting Hall of Fame, what was it like getting that call? It was just a great, I mean, you know, they didn't have to do it, but it's just such a thrill and um, makes me feel so good, you know, a, a connection uh, uh, to the motherland. <laughs> the motherland is watching. Speaking of the motherland, you're wearing your Thunder Bay shirt, aren't you? Sure, I'm happy and proud of it. Canada. I'm so thrilled of my Canadian roots. Uh, born in Toronto, by the way, at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario. One of the amazing things about your career, you are a musician first and foremost, but it, it's how you have managed to have connections to, to a, a hall of fame of comedians. And, and that started in Toronto with the, the stage musical Godspell. And you look at the list of people in the 1970s who were part of that, Martin Short, Andrea Martin, Eugene Levy, Gilda Radner, all of you were, I guess, probably, what, in your early 20s? Did, did you guys have any idea what was to come in your careers at that point? Well, of course not. You know, some of us had high hopes. Uh, but this was our first professional job in, in, in many cases. Certainly in my case, I was right out of the University of Toronto, you know, and had just been playing casual engagements around town. When this came out of the blue, I was hanging heavy with this cast. And we did nothing but hang out together because we were like-minded. And we found compatriotism among, among ourselves. Well, when you had that level of talent together by coincidence, by luck, by good fortune, you know, look what happens. I got to talk about 1063 Avenue Road a house that still is standing where you guys would gather, you'd party, but you'd also create. Take us inside that house in, in, in the 1970s. Uh, such a kick, you know, for you to ask about that house. Uh, 1063 Avenue Road uh, was where Eugene Levy and Martin Short lived together. They split the rental on a house while they were performing gospel together. Anyway, as I said, we hung out incessantly and we did a lot of it at that house uh, after the show, especially on Friday nights, uh, where we would gather after the show and Marty Short deemed it uh, Friday night services <laughs> because we, we took it very seriously. And, and as we always said, our, our Bible was People magazine, <laughs> which I think had just come out at that time. We were celebrity obsessed too. And man, we had a lot of laughs. So you end up in New York, you end up 
as part of the band at the beginning of, of Saturday Night Live, you know, the iconic yeah. first cast. So behind the scenes with Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner and all the people who were part of that, uh, the egos, the pressure, the partying, give us a peek into what that was like. Well, it certainly was wild. There is no question about it. Um, and the wildness did translate to the screen. Uh, the, the show was such that whatever was happening that week was often written into the show. I couldn't believe it sometimes. But that was the, the, how thin the line was between uh, reality and, uh, and comedy, you know? You know, you got to work on your comedy chops as well um, in lots of ways. But, for example, Bill Murray playing the, 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 the lounge singer. And, and you got to be more than just a guy playing the piano. You got to do a little comedy as well. Okay, Polly, you ready to play a little bit of music? No. Now, wait, <laughs> this is the Nick Winter Show, and I do the entertaining. Thank you. Let's go out with something really hot for these folks. A big hit out of 77. A Star Wars. Nothing but Star Wars. Everything was about Star Wars and that theme, nothing but Star Wars, and it just started to write itself, you know? <laughs> I tossed in the line at the bridge and, hey, how about that nutty Star Wars bar? <laughs> Again, everybody was kind of the studio musicians were saying, that's there, the Star Wars bar, remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember? That was everyone's favorite scene, yeah. so I would put that quote in. Um, let's jump ahead to, to David Letterman because that is an association that not only was magical, but a lot of our viewers probably, that, that's where they know you best. Thank you so much, David. You changed our lives. How did it change your life? Because uh, more so than Saturday Night Live, you were front and center on late night throughout the NBC years and the CBS years. Uh, how did it change things for you? Changed my whole life. I became, um, I mean, just by virtue of the fact that it was every day. But it, it, that was a life in itself and a lifestyle in itself. Uh, you always had to do the show. You know, no matter what, I was, uh, you know, when my kid, my, my first child was born uh, at 1.45 in the morning, you know, a.m., that, that next day I was on the show passing out cigars. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the memories will last forever. From Godspell to Saturday Night Live to Spinal Tap to David Letterman, I mean, the well, it's been a career like none other, and uh, it's a thank you. thrill to talk to you and great to hear your story. Ian, thank you for being interested, and uh, hello to everybody, all my relatives and friends up in Canton. By the way, It's Raining Men had a rocky start, rejected by disco superstar Donna Summer, but now it's about to put Schaefer in the Hall of Fame. How's this for a change of pace? From the late night sidekick from Thunder Bay to the Boston Bone Crusher from Weymouth Falls, Nova Scotia. You fought Jack Johnson? Fought him. Beat him clean. A story of a sports great mostly untold until now. We hear from the director of a new short film about a Canadian boxing star right after this. Heavyweight world champion. Him? I don't think so. Sam Langford was from Nova Scotia, and he's one of the best boxers you've likely never heard of. He's considered one of the greatest of all time. He fought through the early 1900s into the 1920s and challenged color barriers. And while his story was largely lost in sports history, a new film will tell that story. Meet the director in our moment. The thing that I, I've always loved and admired about uh, Sam Langford is you've got this guy from Weymouth Falls, Nova Scotia, so rural, rural Canada, and he's decided to set his sights on taking on the world heavyweight champion. It just, it's such an audacious idea. He never actually gets to fight for the belt. And that's because at the time the color line had been drawn, um, so black boxers were not allowed to fight uh, white boxers for the belt Tell me. in the heavyweight division. How did you fool them? Don't know what you mean. So in this film, we take a really small slice of Sam's life late in his career, 1923, three years before 
uh, he, he officially retires. People are, have heard of him are, and are excited that this film is being made, or they've never heard of him and they're shook by it. They're like, how have I not ever heard of this, of, of this guy before? Sure was a different era in so many ways. Record keeping wasn't very good, but apparently he was in 200 to 600 fights. And back then I'm told that fights could be like 60 to 100 rounds. And a lot of people wouldn't fight him. Some of those refusals were because of his color, but Jack Johnson, the black boxer, is one of the people that wouldn't fight him because he was just too good. That's the National for February 21st. If you missed Cross Country Checkup today, our new 60-minute podcast version is posted right now. Good night.